and welcome to part two of Codex Witch Hunters Week, I suppose. Or if you go by my yesterday's title, which happens to be With Hunters. Uh, autocorrect? Yeah? No? I'm sticking to that one. Anyway, we're, today we're going to talk about the actual Adeptus Cerritas, their foundations, expansion, etc. From again, the 4th edition Codex. So, let's begin. The Adeptus Soriatus. The Adeptus Soriatus came into being following Sebastian's forms reforms of the ecclesiarchy at the closing age of the apostasy, when the daughters of the emperor were split into two orders, the Covenant Prioris on Terra and the Covenant Sanctorum on Ophelia Seven. Foundations. Much of the Imperium still reeled from the devastation of Vandera's reign of blood, and so the first few years first years of the sisterhood's existence saw Alicia Dominica leading wars of faith against a score of pretenders but followed in the renegade High Lord's wake. Silvana, Mina, Lucia, Catherine, and Arabella, both sisters who had joined her before the Golden Throne, accompanied, accompanied Dominica. The Sorites were filled with a radiant purpose not invinced since the legendary days of the Great Crusade, and brought the burning light of the Empress' divine judgment to the darkest corners of the Imperium. It was at the height of the Reformation that the Order Heretic Hereticus was formed and not long before the two organisations joined to pursue their common purpose. Though the details are shrouded in mystery, the sisterhood and the witch hunters formalised their relationship in a shadowy conclave referred to in whispered tones as a con convocation of Nephilim. Convocation stated that the Order's militants of the Adepts of Soriatus would place themselves at the disposal of the Order of Hereticus, when never called to do so by a duly appointed Inquisitor. Forming the chamber's militant of the witch hunters, the sisterhood will remain under the auspices of the ecclesiarchy on a day-to-day -day basis and retain the rights and responsibilities granted to them by Sebastian IV. It is postulated by some that the move came about because the High Lords of Terror, in particular, the Inquisitor representative to the Senatorum Imperialis, would not simply stand by and allow the ecclesiarchy to flout the spirit, if not the letter of a decree, passive. Under the terms of convocation of Nephilim, the Ecclesiarchy would retain the Sisters of Battle as a fighting force, and the newly formed Ordo Hereticus would acquire an unswervingly loyal chamber militant. It is also whispered that the knowledge imparted to Dominica and her companions when brought before the Golden Throne coincided in some manner with the shadowy agenda of the Ordo Hereticus. Exactly what joint mi hidden mission the two organisations follow is likely known by the highest ranking members and many heretics have died in excruciating pain and punishment for seeking such knowledge. Expansion In time, this order's militant grew into large and powerful organisations, and Sebastian's fourth successor, Ecclesiast Alexis XXII, decreed the two covenants should be divided into orders militant. The covenant powers was split to become Order of the Eben Chalice, whose first order was Dominica, the Order of the Argent Shroud, led by Silvana. The Covenant Sanctorum was divided in the Order of the Fiery Harp, led by Catherine, and the Order of the Valorous Heart, led by Lucia. By late M36, Sisters of Battle had become synonymous with the, with the temporal power of the Ecclesiarchy, enforcing its dogma and prosecuting its wars across the galaxy, all, all the while supporting the Order of Hereticus in their role as Chamber Militant. The Order spread, establishing subsidiary covenants on key worlds across the Imperial. Imperium. Dominica, Catherine, Savannah, and Lucia, all of whom had been declared living saints in their own lifetime, performed acts that would become legendary even amongst an entire galaxy of legends. But such legends seldom end happily. And first Dominica, then Savannah, and Lucia were martyred at the hands of evil men, men jealous of their faith and purity. When Catherine was murdered by the witch cult Menestius, her order was renamed. The order of our martyred lady, so deeply did her sisters mourn her loss. That was a difficult word to say. In the mid thirty eight, Ecclesiarchus created two more orders the Order of the Bloody Rose, based on the Covenant Sanctorum, and the Order of the Sacred Rose, based on the Covenant Prioris. Both were formed from groups of sisters who venerated the remaining two companions of Dominica, Mina and Arabella. And although these long dead martyrs never led their orders in battle, each was founded with one of their names, the Bloody Rose in honour of Mina, and the Sacred Rose after Arabella. The Rise of a Lesser Order Militant 
As numbers within the Order's militant waxed and waned, varying from a couple of thousand warriors to many thousands, the subsidiary covenants began to take on importance of their own. These small scattered bases often proved ideal for reacting to requests for assistance from the Order of Hereticus, and so over time became independent of the Orders that had founded them, establishing their own traditions, doctrines, livery, and titles. Though the original six Orders are by far the most numerous and active of all the Orders militants, the new lesser Orders militant, or Orders minoris, became especially useful in the frequent purity sweeps and programs instituted by the Witch Hunters. The Sisterhood and the Witch Hunters Throughout history, the Deptus Soriatus have been instrumental in many actions, some of which, due to their instigation at the hands of a secretive order of hereticus, may never be written in the official histories of the Imperium. St. Asperia, 18th Canoness of the Order of the Bloody Rose, led her sisters in a war of faith against the tyrant Denescura, liberating a hundred worlds with a force of only a thousand warriors. When the arch-confessor Cornelius preached the war of faith, a sort of demagogues of a second halo schism burned on piles of twenty meters high, it was the orders of the, or it was the warriors of the Order of the Sacred Rose that broke the back of the cult's fanatical defense and the Palace of Radiance. When the notorious confessor Petasius and his program against the mutants of Chakrak, which was the order of the Arden Shroud and the Canon's preceptor Chrisma. I'm sorry, I'm just thinking Terry Pratchett Chrisma. <laughs> whose flame has cleansed the streets and the foul taint of genetic deviancy. Yeah, it doesn't say Chrisma, it just says Chrisma. Like, literally, C H R I S I M A. Chrisma. Like it was in Terry Pratchett. And you've got to have proper Christmas. Though no complete records exist to describe it, but it is believed that the Order of our Martyred Lady, acting under, under the orders of Witchfinder Tannenberg, of the Order Hereticus, who is descended upon the great, um, upon the Saint Garrett Scriptorum, dragging hundreds of Adeptus and Terra scribes, screaming to the excruciating chambers of Nemesis Tessera, and burning down the Scriptorum, the Adepts lodged a formal complaint with the very highest authorities of terror, but was silenced when inquisitor. Tannenberg, who had produced 300 specimen jars, each contained the preserved remains of a scribe. His previous hidden mutations uncovered for all to witness, each stared, them, each stared from its jar in mute necrotic terror. His hideous form stark evidence of horror lurking within the bosom bosom of the administratum. Defenders of the Faith As the 41st millennium drew to a close, the Adeptus Soriatus was involved in the most infamous co in the conflicts to erupt in living memory. On Armageddon, the order of our martyred lady suffered so losses so grievous at the hands of the orcs that it changed its delivery, replacing black robes with red for honour the martyrdom. The sisters who fell at High Tempestora. At the termination of that troubled millennium, the battle sisters of the Adeptus Soriatus stood amongst the multitudinous of defenders of the Cadian Gate, ready to sacrifice all for the very future of the Imperium and mankind, their faith so potent a weapon as the bodies, their devotion, as strong a shield as their armour. Anyway, no. that's another good story. I like it's got the um, background of where the orders came from and how they came to be. Uh, but what really interested me, apart from what made me laugh, is he, I think it's pretty much from Te uh, Terry Pratchett, where he read um, on the Discworld novels where Nobby Nobs was talking about Chrisma. And yeah, the kind of preceptor Chrisma, I definitely reckon is an Easter egg, if that's what you want to call it, from the Discord novels. Just made me giggle when I first read it. But what really got me interested is the final paragraph is talking about the Caden Gate falling. Well, kind of, it's hinting at it. And again, this is from the 4th edition codex, and I love it when. I read the old codexes, it's one of my favourite parts, reading one of the old codexes and seeing, wait, that's now happened. So this abdicating gate, having this massive force against, what well, I mean like, it's got this, it, it, it obviously shows that they're going to be facing something big and it does, it very much feels like that is talking about the fall of Cadia, which we know now has happened and I love it because it shows growth within the 40k millennium, the 40k universe. Um, not many universes do this, with little hints. I, Star Wars grows with people marrying, growing up, and stuff like that, but to, but never really with what I've read. And I've read quite a bit. 
with the actual galaxy itself, we've never really seen much growth. We, we've seen like the old Republic, the Imperial, the, the Imperial forces, and then now the New Republic or, you know, the First Order. And it's not really a growth, it's just a matter of events. It's never really expand outwards to make it seem any more dangerous or anything like that. But this is, to me, showing that they were preparing for the fall of Cadia way back when. Other notes, um, of course, you've got, which again, the, again, the goes of growth is how the Covenant of the Fiery Heart changed its name to the Martyr Lady because, of course, the death of Dominica, and then, once again, changing their robes to red after Armageddon. Again, I just like that. The evolution of this, of the, the order of the um, of our Martyred Lady, what we've seen that grow and change because of events that have obviously uh, affected them so much that they they changed as a whole order. And of course, a little bit of background where we know where we, now we come from, like the Covenant of Pronoris and the Covenant of, uh, uh, It's right in front of me, why can I not see it? The Covenant Prioris was split into all, and the Covenant Sanctorum is where they came from. Of course, this is, I don't know if any people go, oh, there was a new book. Oh, okay. Well, this channel's for you guys anyway. And just these little things, it really makes this interesting to read. And it is a fun and interesting to read. Like some of the secrecy with um, Inquisitor Tannenberg just wiping out an entire scriptorum. And when when called into question, because yeah, look, this is what happened. It was like, look, it's, there was mutants in there, dude, come on, mutants. I knew what I was doing. You shouldn't question me. I know, I know what I'm doing. And again, um, we have things that, Royals of the Order of Sacred Rays that broke the back of culture and ethical defense on passive radiance. You know, it's not just, um, that they are fight they're fighting for like the absolute faith and I do like this and I like the idea of the sisters about I always did. I've always thought it was pretty cool and they always looked cool. Anyway, I think I've rambled on for a moment enough. Thank you for listening. Uh I do hope you all have a good day. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, uh ring that notification bell. For you regular viewers, uh question for you guys. Should I go on to Warhammer Age of Sigma and Fantasy? Leave your comments down below. I do appreciate everyone who watches these videos, and I've hit over 250 subscribers now, which makes me really happy. Thank you very much. And I do hope you all have a great day, and, ha and have a lovely time. Now, speak to you all tomorrow with part three. And it won't be rip hunters, it'll be witch hunters, I promise.